hello, hello. Let's just tweak this out. Cool. Hey Oliver, how are you doing? Thanks for coming along. Can you all can you all hear me all right? Let's check OBS real quick. All seems to be good. Um, out of interest, what does the quality look like? Because last time I streamed, it only went up in 720p, I believe. And I've I've uh, updated the. Oh, is there echo? Uh, there is echo. Why is there echo? Uh, is there echo for anybody else or? No echo for me, but a bit quiet. Okay, uh, we're turning up the mic. How does that sound? Just turned up the gain a little bit. Um, I just I don't want my keyboard to be too loud because it's mechanical. I don't want it to. You know, I'm one of those people. <laughs> um, hey, Kevin. Cool. Uh, no, I don't want to shut down OBS. I want to minimize it. Cool, we've got a couple of people here. That's good. Let's make sure Twitter saw the tweet. Yeah, cool. Um, I've I've noticed a lot of people come back after the fact to watch this. The the stream from the other week has uh, yay for mechanical keyboards, indeed. Yeah, <laughs> the clickety clack. Hey Dan. Um, cool. Let's just jump right into it. So I'm going to be doing some Rust. Um, if you're not familiar with Rust, it is a systems language. It's quite low level, um, not as low level as C. It does some things for you, like memory management. Um, we haven't got to put up with uh, malloc, m malloc uh, for memory allocation and stuff like that. Um, and it's an interesting language. It's fun to write. Lots of cool features. Um, not very friendly for beginners. If you've never done, if you've never done C before, C plus plus, it's quite weird. Uh, there's something called the borrow checker, which scares a lot of people. Um, but yeah, so I'm gonna create a new file here. Uh, so I'm gonna be working on a Lexer. And if you don't know what a Lexer is. I've seen a little Rust code, but haven't written any myself. Yeah, I think that's the case for a lot of people. A lot of people have seen Rust or heard of Rust, but they've never actually written it. Um, so I'm just going to jump straight into it. I'll be streaming for half an hour, 45 minutes. Let's uh, let's see how it goes. Hopefully, we can get something good going uh, during the stream, but uh, we'll, we'll see where we get to. So programming languages. That's basically what I'm going to be building, a, a, a programming language, a scripting language, to be precise. Um, so we're going to start with a Lexer. So if, if you don't know how general programming languages work, uh, you have a stream of input, and that goes into something called the Lexer, which spits out a bunch of tokens. Uh, I've got Alexa talking to me in the background as well, which is great. Um, so you get input that goes into the tokenizer or the Alexa. Um, that spits out a bunch of tokens. So you can kind of think of that as uh, just an array of tokens. And then you pass that into a parser. Um, I'm going to be building a very simple interpreter. It's called a tree walk interpreter. And this will be over a couple of streams probably. Um, but this is an experiment. I'm writing Rust. Uh, so we're going to have a bit of fun with it. Um, and the, the parser can do a couple of things. It can transform those tokens into some sort of semantic structure. Uh, and you would generally call that an AST, an abs uh, abstract syntax tree. Um, and if you've used PHP parser before, that's what that does. It takes PHP code, uh, takes the tokens and generates an AST. And then you can whack that through uh, an interpreter, which will go through the AST and it will look at each node or each uh, each branch in the AST, if you like, 
uh, and evaluate it and do something based on the type of node. So we're going to start at the very beginning today. We're going to be uh, taking some input, just a string of random characters, and we're going to be running that through a lexer and spitting out a bunch of tokens. So let's get started. Let's come up with a grammar. How many people have we got here? Six people, seven people. Nice. Um, is the quality good? How's the quality for everyone? Hopefully it's 1080p, if you can stream it at 1080p. Um, it was 720 last time. I'm gonna increase my font size a little bit as well. Um, so I'm, I'm just calling this PL for programming language. I'll come up with a better name at some point, but this is just an experiment, so it doesn't really matter. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll jump into 1080 works fine, perfect. Uh, we'll, we'll jump into a bit of basic Rust. So Rust has a command line tool called Cargo, and this is very similar to NPM Composer. Uh, it manages packages, it can run and build your Rust app, it can run tests, it can benchmark, it can initialize new projects. So to build out this structure here, all I did was Cargo init PL, and that created a cargo.toml file, a gignore, and then a source and main.rs file. Let's jump into the cargo.toml as well. Uh, so toml is kind of like YAML. You know, it's just a configuration language. There's nothing special. It's purely for config. Um, and it's got some keys. So this is package information and all of the dependencies go down here. Uh, a nice git ignore, which hides the target folder, which you can see here. And a main.rs. So like many low-level compiled languages, uh, basically non-scripting languages, there's a main function, which is the entry point for the program. Uh, so if I go into the terminal and I do cargo run, it's gonna go through, it's gonna build our application in debug mode. So it's not purely optimized, it's uh, just for quick builds. And it's gonna run this main function. I don't need to go down here and, and call main because it's, it's the entry point. Uh, so this is all working, this is great. Um, a couple of other things, this might look weird to you. This print line here has an exclamation mark. So this is known as a macro. So if you caught my PHP uh, source code stream, you might have seen some C macros like a PHP function. And all this does is it basically expands out into another statement or expression. Uh, so you can see that here, macro rules, print line. It's uh, deferring to print with a, a line break at the end, but it's taken in uh, a very addict number of arguments and it evaluates to this, to io underscore print. Um, it just hides some of the internal logic, just like C does, just like C uh, preprocessor macros. Um, so let's define a grammar. What do we want to start with? Let's do something simple like variable declarations. So I'm thinking we'll use let, um, just like JavaScript. And we can probably change the language mode to JavaScript just to get some syntax highlighting. Uh, hopefully the font's big enough. If it's not, let me know, I'll bump it up. So we'll do something similar to JavaScript. So we can have a, a let statement here and we'll give it a variable name. Let's call it foo. And we'll use bar and I'm gonna actually emit semicolons. I don't want any semicolons in my language. Um, I don't use semicolons in my JavaScript. I don't wanna use them here. So we'll actually emit the semicolons. So what we wanna do is just loop through this string character by character and we want to say well do we know what this word means and if we do we want to spit out some sort of token so we might call this t let so t underscore let this isn't exactly what the rust is going to look like um, because there's a few things in rust that can help us out um, but this is going to turn into t let which is semantically the token name it's a let token uh, foo is an identifier, 
So we might have something called T identifier um, equals might just be T equals. Uh, although this might be a bit misleading because when you when you think of equals, you think of two equals signs um, or two equals symbols or uh, whatever you want to call them. Uh, so we might we might call this T a sign instead. We'll get to that. Uh, and then we have a string, so we might have T string to represent a string token uh, or a string literal in this case. So that's that's the basic idea. We want to turn this random stream of characters into some tokens which semantically mean something. They mean something to us, to our interpreter. Uh, so I'm going to use this file. Um, and where is the best place to start? Let's. Um, so I want to say cargo run, and then I want to be able to pass through a path. So to this hello world file, doesn't do anything at the minute, but I want to read in the contents of this file. So Rust has a very extensive standard library, thankfully, uh, because you don't want to write this stuff yourself. Um, and it's all namespaced as well. So we have a use expression or a use statement, a bit like PHP, but instead of having something like, you know, illuminate support, uh, we have standard, which is the standard library namespace, and we have FS or the file system. And this is gonna allow us to access any functions or uh, structs or uh, traits uh, inside of this namespace using the FS uh, binding. So we can say fs colon colon, and we can access all of these methods that are inside of this namespace. You can see there's some structs here. Uh, we'll get to that later. Uh, but for now, we just want to read in the file contents. So we're going to need the file system, and we're also going to want the env uh, library. Uh, because the env is, if I just type this out here, you can see we get access to args, which is going to be... Uh, everything that's passed in here. So let's just print out env arg. So we'll say let args. This is how you declare something in Rust. You use let and the name. And uh, we'll just set this equal to env args. Um, and Rust has uh, types, everything is typed. So I, I can put a code on here and put a type if I want, but I'm not going to because we'll let Rust infer the type through type inference. Uh, it knows what args is returning, so it knows that args must be of a certain type. Uh, if we look at this, it is standard env args, which is great. Um, and let's use that print line. So we can do some formatting here. A bit like you do with sprintf or printf in PHP. Uh, you can use format strings or template strings kind of inside of these literals and Rust will uh, look at this and say I need to format this value in a certain way. The colon question mark here means that it doesn't have a particular formatting standard so instead we use its debug uh, formatting which for a lot of things is just going to print out the name of the struct and any public arguments that it makes available. Uh, so let's run this and we'll see what happens. So you can see it's printed out args and the inner value, we've got the script name or the executable name and then our argument. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not gonna spend too much time going into uh, the ins and outs of Rust um, because that, that's you know a whole video series, a whole video course on its own. Um, so env args has a couple of convenience methods um, let me know if you've got any questions in the chat as well. Happy to answer. Um, so we can use dot, just like an object in JavaScript uh, or any C style language really. Um, and we can use the nth method, which returns the nth element on the args struct or the iterator. Um, and we want to get the first argument because uh, this is, sorry, not the first argument, the first index. Uh, this is zero and this is one. So if we add a print line back in and we put Farlim in there, <coughs> uh, it's having a go at us. Um, and this is where you might get caught out if you're 
not familiar with Rust. So Rust doesn't have null. Um, there's no null like this in PHP and JavaScript. There's no nil like in Go. Um, and there's no null like in C. Uh, instead, Rust has something called option. Uh, and there's PHP libraries that do this sort of thing. And it's actually something that I could see happening in the future um, if we get uh, if we get enums in PHP that can hold values. Um, we'll get to that later. Um, but this is this is how Rust handles null essentially. Uh, so option can either be sum or none. So if something is nullable, like a, a function argument or a field on a struct, you can uh, say what well, is actually an option and generically type it. So again, generics, uh, something that we're probably all quite excited to have in PHP at some point, whether that's uh, runtime generics or statically analyzed generics uh, as a as a syntax in the in the language. Um, this is saying that whatever this variable or uh, property or field on the struct is, it might have a string, it might not have a string. So in this case, we, we know that we're passing in a file, so we can unwrap. And this is gonna take whatever's inside of that option and return it. So the inner value, it will return it. And if for whatever reason the option is none, meaning it's null, uh, you can think of it like that, it's null, this will panic and this this will basically throw an exception and it won't compile. So I can show you an example. If I just run this without any arguments, uh, you can see thread main panicked at called option unwrap on a none value and in the file that we said. And that's because we didn't pass through a file. And if I do it now with a file, we get the file name printed out. Uh, similar to C++, yeah, similar to C++. I mean, Rust is kind of like C++++, you know? Um, that's a good way to think of it. If you know C++, Rust is probably gonna be fairly easy to pick up. Um, standard vector ball, uh, civ n plus one. Yeah, I don't really know what a civ is in C++. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, I guess if you unwrap that, you know, there's no, I know, I know C++ has uh, like null pointers. So if you've got a pointer that can, can be null, um, but from what you've put in there, uh, Hamid, it, it, it looks a lot cleaner in Rust. Uh, just a oh, sample of the typing in, right? Yeah. We'll, we'll get to some typing in stuff eventually. Um, so let's not hang about. Let's get the contents of this file. So we're going to reach into FS and we're going to uh, read to string. So this is going to take the file path that we provide and it's going to read it into a string. Um, so we'll say file. And again, we need to call unwrap this time. So again, for PHP developers, this is going to be a bit weird. Even for JavaScript developers, it's going to be a bit weird. Rust doesn't have the concept of exceptions um, in, in the same sense that we're familiar with. You can't, you can't turn around and say throw new exception. Uh, Rust has something called a result type. And this is kind of similar to option. It's either okay or an error. And it's also generic. So in the case of contents, if we hover, uh, we get uh, an IO result string. So if everything's okay, we'll get a string, otherwise we'll get an instance of error. So again, for now, I'm just gonna up unwrap this. Uh, if I don't provide a file, it's not gonna get to this point. If I, uh, it's not gonna get to this point if I don't provide a file. If I provide a file that doesn't exist, so let's try that, let's just put an S on the end. It's also gonna panic because we're trying to unwrap an error uh, and it gives us the error, which is no such file or directory. Uh, so let's print line again, uh, and we know we've got a string. So we, we don't need to use this debug formatting like we did before, because it's a string. Uh, it can be printed and formatted as it is. So let's just print out the contents. 
uh, and this file doesn't exist. So there we go. So we've just read a file in Rust. So we now have the contents. Great. So we're making progress. We've successfully read a file. Um, in, in PHP, you're probably going to do, you know, argv or something like that to get the first argument and then file get contents or f open, f read. Um, but here there's actual, the, the standard library is namespaced, unlike PHP where everything in the standard library is global, uh, which is a good thing or a bad thing depending on how you see it. Um, how many people have got? Six, seven. Nice. Cool. Um, okay, where should we go next? Let's create a struct. So Rust uh, doesn't have classes. It's not, it's not an OOP language in that sense. There's no classes. There's no abstract classes. There's no um, interfaces in in that sense. Uh, but it does have structs, um, which are kind of like classes. Um, so structs have fields like a class. So I'm going to create a contents field. And this is going to be a string. So this struct lexa is going to take in the contents that we say here. Um, and a bit like a class, structs can have methods. Uh, and we use this impl word, implement. Uh, so we're going to write the implementation real quick. What happens on error? Like, do you just validate it exists before unwrapping? Um, yeah, we'll get to that in a second, actually. I'll, I'll kind of show you how that works. Um, let's just write out a basic Lexa implementation. Um, so yeah, we can implement a Lexa, and this is where we're going to put all of the methods. Uh, so <clears throat> for a method to be public, we use the pub keyword and fn, <coughs> sorry, uh, fn, which is the function keyword. Uh, and in Rust, we either say default or new typically. So we're going to say new because we're going to be constructing a new uh, Lexa. And uh, this is going to be a static method. And this is, again, really strange for anyone who hasn't seen Rust before. Um, so we're going to take in the contents here and we're going to say string. And because we're returning something from this function, we have to declare a return type. The return types on a function have to match. Uh, what you're returning has to be declared as the return type. And just like PHP, where you can say self or static, Rust has some uh, helper or shorthands for that. So we can say self. Uh, we, we could also say lexa here. This, this works perfectly fine. Um, but we'll say self. This is good practice because if you change the name of Lexa to something in the future, you haven't then got to go through all of these return types uh, and return, uh, change it to Lexa. You can keep it as self. Uh, so in here, we're going to say self. And to create a struct, if you've seen other languages, you use curly braces and you pass in the properties or the fields. Um, and this works because Rust has implicit returns. So we don't need to explicitly say return self. Uh, Rust will take the last expression or the last statement in a function, uh, emit the semicolon from the end, and it will use that as a return value. <coughs> um, so it's implicit, which is great. Um, we can also, a bit like JavaScript, because the variable name and the field name are the same, we don't need to do the assign. We can let the engine figure that out for itself. Um, okay, so let, let's just create a Lexa real quick. So we can say let Lexa equal, and this is in the current scope, so we can reference the Lexa directly. It's not inside of a namespace, it's in, in the current scope. It's like writing two classes in the same file in PHP. Um, and this is a static method. I'll show you why that is in a second. Uh, so we can use colon colon, just like PHP, uh, even Java, I believe. Uh, we can say new, and we can pass in the contents. 
And if I print line this, um, it's not going to work. Uh, and that's because I need to add this. I'll, I'll explain this later or in another stream. So if I, if I print this out now, you'll see that we've got our instance instance of Alexa of the Alexa um, Alexa stop she's listening um, and we've got our contents filled um, and rust has done some magic with this up here which I won't go into because uh, again these are things that you can learn in a in a rust course um, so Sam if you're still here Sam here is the answer um, why is Dan laughing? What What's funny? Um, is it because I said that I'm not going to go into this? This is magic under the hood. Um, I won't explain how it... Oh, yeah, she's annoying. Um, I won't say her name because I'll trigger everyone. Um, so, Sam, if, if you're still here, you can... You can validate if this exists. So unwrap is almost like, I know this is gonna exist, but in the case that it doesn't, I want you to panic. I want you to throw an error and stop compiling uh, or stop running the program. If we didn't do this, uh, let's rename this to maybe contents uh, because this has a result. We can actually use a match statement or an if. Uh, so again, this is going to be really weird for anyone who hasn't seen Rust. But basically everything in Rust is an expression. So an if statement isn't an if statement, it's an if expression, or it can be used as an expression. So we can go down here and we can say, let contents equal if. Um, so we're going to want an if else here. Um, this is really bizarre. When I, when I first learned Rust, this baffled me because this is like, unseen in other languages it, it's like a ternary but in long if else else if form uh, because it's, it's an expression so this is evaluated as an expression and the return value inside of the blocks is assigned to contents so uh, we don't actually need parentheses here well wow, didn't know you were live glad did yeah hey man um we don't need parentheses rust doesn't enforce this uh, you don't need to add parentheses around uh, conditions which is nice as well something that I'm not going to add to this language um, so we can actually say here if let uh, or sorry if maybe content dot is okay so if you remember this is a result so it's either okay or error uh, so in this if statement we can excuse me uh, we can say if the maybe content is okay, then we'll get the maybe contents and unwrap. Uh, we don't we don't want this colon here uh, because it's going to be used as the as the return value for contents. And there's a little error here. And like I said before, everything has to have a compatible type. So in this case, if and else have incompatible types because up here, I'm implicitly returning a string. Whereas down here, I'm not returning anything. There's no return. Uh, so instead, I'll put panic, which is another one of those macros. It's special. Uh, the implementation under the hood uh, is, is magic. It takes this string that I provide and it uh, outputs it at runtime as, as an error. Um, so I'll put a message in here. Could not open file for reading. Uh, and now if I go back and run this with a, a non-existent file, you can see my error message is being shown instead. Uh, so that's how that works. So you've got if expressions. You don't have to unwrap up here. Uh, no try catch, but instead check that it's okay, then implicit return. Yeah, basically, there's there's no real try catch. This is your try catch, the, uh, an if statement to say if it's okay, do this. Otherwise, that is okay will be false or false if it's an error um, and you, you can do the same with this up here let's do the same with this just for demonstration purposes so this is maybe a file we don't know yet uh, so up here we can say let file equal 
and we'll do uh, an if else again. Uh, but this time we're not checking if it's okay. We want to know if it is some value. So remember, option is either sum or none. So in this case, if it's sum, we want to unwrap it and return the string, which will be the file name. Otherwise, we want to panic. Uh, we want to say, you know, expected a file. Um, so we can use let inside of an if. Similar in PHP, if you said uh, if error equals this, get error or this error. Right. This is uh, basically a let statement or an assignment inside of a condition, which is perfectly fine. You can do that in Rust. Uh, so we're going to say if let sum uh, equal maybe file. And this is Rust uh, pattern matching. Um, so like I said before, option is generic. So if you were to return sum, like this, you would have to pass in a value. Uh, you might pass in a string literal like high. Um, so now sum has an inner value. Again, sorry if this is going over your head. It's complex. Um, sum is holding a value, but we need to get that value out. So up here, we can uh, do some pattern matching and internally Rust is gonna say, well, does maybe file match this pattern? Is it sum? And does it hold a value? Um, and I'm just going to call this F. So now when Rust evaluates this, it's going to say, if let maybe file some pattern like this. So is maybe file some? And does it hold a variable? And if it does, it will assign it to F. So down here, I can say F. Um, otherwise, I can panic. Uh, expected a file. Uh, ask me any, any questions if you've got them as well, by the way. Um, I'll try my best to answer. Um, so this is this is probably confusing. Um, so if, if we said some string like this, uh, say maybe file equals some string, Rust is going to say, well, it is some, so that's true, and it holds the value string. So it will take whatever's inside of here and it will assign it to F in this case. Um, so if we run, this should work fine. And if we don't, it should error still. And if we get rid of the file path completely, because uh, because maybe file is none, this is failing and we're dropping down into panic. Uh, cool. So let's get this again. So we've got our output, great. Uh, so let's actually get into some of the juicy stuff. Um, let's see how much we can get done in 15 minutes. Let's say 15 minutes. Cool. I should have got a glass of water. The, the Pepsi's not doing it. Um, right, so we've got our Lexa. I'm just looking for any questions in the chat. How many people here? Seven, eight, cool. Right, so we've got our Alexa. Um, Alexa's going off again. I'm just gonna unplug her so she doesn't get on my nerves. RIP Alexa. Um, so we've got our Alexa and we can add a method to the Alexa and we will call it Lex, I guess. We want the Lexa to Lex something. So we'll create this method called Lex. Uh, and like I said, this, this is where it gets a bit funny because Rust doesn't have any sense of this or self um, in the generic sense. I can't come down here and say this.contents uh, or you know, like you would in PHP or JavaScript. Uh, there's, there's no this binding. Instead, if you want it to be an instance method, so if you want it to have access to whatever we've returned up here, you need to type in uh, a reference to self, just like this. Uh, so this is the same as saying this, but we're saying self and it's a reference to this. Uh, so we, we have access to this completely, which is great. If I came down here and I said uh, print line 
self.contents. Uh, we'll come down here and we'll say lexa.lex. If we run this, you can see that the contents get output uh, because this, this is uh, saying we require self, so it's an instance method, uh, and therefore we can access all of the fields on the struct. Uh, another interesting fact is Rust variables are immutable by default, meaning I can't come in here and say lexa.contents equals. This won't work uh, because lexa isn't mutable. And to do that, we can put the mut keyword in front. So this is creating a mutable binding or declaration. Um, and it's having a go at me at the minute because the variable doesn't need to be mutable. So there's a lot of uh, pre-compilation things that, that happen here. Uh, so the variable doesn't need to be mutable and that's because I'm, I'm not mutating it anywhere. Uh, but we will do it at some point. So again, if I came up here and I tried to change self.contents, uh, let's do string from hello. If I compile this, it's going to have a go at me um, because self is a normal reference. It cannot be written uh, written to. So let x as con unless it's yeah, that's exactly it, Dan. Um, yeah, let by itself is the same as const. Everything is immutable by default. Um, if you want to mutate something, you have to make make it mutable using mut. Uh, and we need to do a similar thing inside of here. I've said that it's mut, it's mutable down here, but that's not good enough um, because I'm only asking for a normal reference. I'm not asking uh, even if you're mutating object properties. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, even if you're object uh, mutating object properties, that's right because you're still mutating something, even internally, you're still mutating something. Um, and that's the issue here. Self is a uh, ampersand reference. It's not a mutable reference. So down here, I need to say mut, and this will give me a mutable reference, which means I can uh, say self.contents equals something else. Uh, pass by reference in C++ works like this. And then work with B. Is there such thing in Rust? Um, pass by reference. Yeah, you can. You can pass references through to functions. Um, in a in a similar thing, there you, you pass through a literal reference, and then B ends up being a, a pointer to A uh, or to the memory address of A. Um, Dan, yeah, just comparing it to JS, which allows object prop reassignment with const. I think yeah, that is right because JavaScript is rubbish um, and doesn't make sense. Uh, because yeah, if you've got an array or an object uh, in JavaScript under const, you can you can change it still, which is baffling. Um, cool, so now we've got this mutable reference. Uh, so we're gonna be doing something with the contents up here. Um, so there's a couple more things that Alexa actually needs. So we've got the Alexa itself and we're storing the contents. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna loop through this sort of letter by letter. Um, so we need to figure out what position we're currently in. So up here, we're gonna need um, some sort of pointer, what do we call it? Let's just let's just call it counter for now. Uh, we need to type this. So I'm gonna say this is a U size, which is just an unsized, uh, unsigned integer, sorry. Um, it's a primitive type. Uh, and because that's a field, I have to declare it down here. So we'll start at zero, because uh, we're gonna be looking at the zero index. Um, and what else does a Lexa need to do? So let's think, let's think. Uh, so it's got the source. Um, I'm guessing actually the source shouldn't just be stored as a, a string. We probably want it to be a vector uh, or some sort of iterable type. Uh, so I'm gonna go up here and we're gonna use a generic type. So we're gonna say vec, 
which is a vector. It allows you to push and pop and get the length. Um, and we're going to be storing chars, so characters, um, because we're, we're, we're going to be looping through each individual character in here. Uh, we're just going to store it as a char, just as a, a single byte. So we've basically got a vector of characters or bytes here. Which does mean down here we need to change this slightly. We need to say content is content.chars. And what does this return? It's going to have a go at me um, because it's returning a special type for chars. So can we say uh, to vec or iter or vec? Hmm. Let's think. Uh, oh. No, I'm, I'm being silly. There is a method for this. Contents.chars.collect. So a bit like uh, PHP, you get a vector, which is basically a collection. It's a, an array object, if you like. Uh, so this is going to return um, a vector of characters or chars. Um, or in this case, you know, you're know, you iterating over it, turning it into an integer, and then collecting it. Uh, so this is great. Let's check that this compiles, which it does. Great. Uh, what else do we need for Alexa? We need... Hmm. <laughs> I think this is fine for now. To get a very basic Alexa going, I, th I think this is fine. Because we, we've got a counter, so we know what our current position is, and we've got all of the chars. I'm going to rename this to source as well, because it's, it's the source of everything. It's, it's the meaning of life. Um, cool. So let's do something else. Let's introduce some tokens. So I'm going to do this using a struct again. So we're going to have a token struct. Um, we're going to have a token type and we're going to have a lexamy, which is basically the literal, it's the literal form. Uh, maybe I'll call it a token literal instead. Uh, and the, the literal can be a string as well. Uh, and the token type is going to be some sort of enum. Enums are coming to php.8.1 uh, and they're very similar. So we're going to say token kind. And now this is the where we're going to define whether it's an identifier, whether it's a string, whether it's a sign, whether it's a let. Um, so let's start with identifier. So again, if you're not familiar with enums, it's just a way of structuring uh, static, well not necessarily static, but like named uh, concepts. Uh, it's, it's given a name and a type to something, you can type in these in, in a function. Uh, so we're going to have an identifier, we're going to have the assign, we're going to have the let token, and we're also going to have the string token. Great. Uh, so token type, we can come down here, and let's rename this to kind, so that it's in line with the name of this enum. Um, yep, yeah, this sounds good. And we don't need to do anything here necessarily. Uh, we can implement this struct and we can give it the new method like we did with Alexa. And we're going to pass in the kind, which is a token kind. And we're going to pass in the string and just return it. So we can say kind literal. So now when we want to make a token, we can go somewhere token new. And we need to say the kind. So if it's an identifier, we might say token kind identifier. So this is how you create an instance of an enum. And we pass in a string. Uh, we'll use let. Uh, and this isn't actually a string. So we can do as, oh sorry, to string or to owned like this. I'll explain this a little bit later. Um, but this, this is how we're going to use this method. Cool. Uh, so let, let's try and see how fast we can 
get this into a token stream. Let's start with a vector. So we're going to say let tokens equal vec new. So we're creating a new vec. Uh, type annotations needed, which is fine. So we need to make this generic. So I'm going to come in here. Vec is generic. So I'm going to say this is a vector of tokens. And because this variable's got a type hint, Rust can automatically infer this here. Because I've said this is going to be a vector of tokens, when I say vec new, Rust knows that this is going to be a vector of tokens because it looks back here. Uh, I could also put the generic here um, and call new like that. And this is going to be the same thing. Uh, this would mean I can remove the type hint or the, the type declaration on, on the variable. Uh, but we'll, we'll do it like this just for fun. I wouldn't I wouldn't normally do this. I'd either do it one way or the other. Um, but this is fine. Rust is going to throw errors if we give it the wrong type anyway. Cool. So let's think. Let's think. We basically... We, we want to loop through all of the characters from source and for each of them we want to match them up against some sort of pattern right um, so let's create a while loop and we want to say while counters or sorry while uh, self dot source dot length is greater than self dot counter we want to do something down here uh, and we'll just we'll just plus plus for now or sorry plus equals one if we run this it doesn't have an infinite loop because we're incrementing counter at the end um, and we're checking against the length of the source so let's start with a very very simple one um, let's use a match expression. Uh, so match is also in PHP now. Uh, it allows you sort of like a switch case, but a lot more efficient. Uh, it allows you to pattern match. So we want to get the current token, or sorry, the current character at this index or at self.counter. Um, so let's do let's create a method for this we'll say char at and we'll pull in self and we'll also pull in um, actually let's let's create a current char method this is going to return a char uh, because this is a, a vector of chars um so we can just say if self dot oh, sorry counter is greater than if self dot counter is greater than self dot source dot length we can return none this is a good example actually of using option we'll come in here and we'll say option so we're returning none, so this won't be able to unwrap. Uh, otherwise, we'll return some char, which will be self dot source dot get. We're going to get this particular index, uh, and we'll say self dot cursor. Uh, this is also an option. Um, so technically, we can we can actually just do this. We can just say self dot source dot get self uh, dot counter I think uh, expected char found a reference to char uh, can we just de dereference it no do we have to unwrap it and then dereference it Let's say char okay there you go so this, this is what we're going to do we're, we're always going to return a char we're not going to bother with any error handling right now so while self.source.length is greater than self.counter, uh, we'll match 
self dot current jar, uh, and with a match, we need to make sure that all possible cases of current char are covered, which in the case of char is like, you know, every alphanumeric character, any any character really. Uh, so for now, let's just use underscore, which is like a wildcard. And let's just print line. Um, let's actually assign this. So I'll say C is self.currentchar. Um, and we'll match against C. Let's just print out C. Uh, and let's make sure we don't get any infinite loops. Let's plus equals one. And if we run this, you can see we get every single character because we're just looping over them. You know, we're saying get the current jar, print it out, and move on. So we get LET, we get some white space as well, which we'll handle uh, because white space won't make a difference. Uh, we get a, a single uh, quote, uh, and this seems to be working fine. So let's start with a sign. <clears throat> In Rust, chars are you uh, are represented using single quotes like this. And if I hover over it, it will have a go at me because it's empty. It's a character literal. Uh, so I want to say if this is equals, then we're going to drop down into a block down here. And let's just put this underscore. Rust has a nice unimplemented uh, macro, which if it encounters something that's not implemented, it will panic and let you know. Uh, we've still got quite a few people here, which is nice. I'm glad you're still here, sticking around. Again, let me know if you've got any questions. Um, if anything's not making sense, let me know. I'll try to explain it. Um, so we're matching against C. We want to say if it matches this pattern, in this case just a single equal sign or the assign token in our case, we're going to return uh, a... We're not going to return, sorry. We're going to self.push. Uh, let's actually remove this as well. Let's do this. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave this empty so that it doesn't panic. Um, but we'll, we'll move this inside of this match arm. Um, yeah, so when you when you match a statement, you can drop into this block of code here, just this, this block. Um, and running this won't won't do anything because we're not uh, incrementing down here. Uh, so we'll, we'll just do the same down here as well. Um, so it finishes fine. But what we want to do is we want to generate or build a new token and we want to push it up into tokens up here. So we'll say uh, tokens.push. And this is going to have a go at us because it's expecting some arguments. Um, and we need to push a token. So we can say token new. This is the method that we made earlier. We're going to have token kind of assign. Uh, and the literal is going to be an equals uh, to, or how do we do this? Uh, we'll do equals to owned. Uh, this is going to have a go at us now as well because I'm trying to mutate tokens, but it's not declared as mutable. So I need to say mut. And if I run this, uh, and it would help if I printed out the vector, um, we're just gonna print it out like this. Um, tokens, uh, token doesn't, in, okay. Let's do all this. Um, Let's do it up here as well. Uh, derive debug. Um, in, sh in short, this debug up here adds some methods to the enum or the struct that lets it print nicely uh, when we're trying to output it using this uh, debug format down here. So if I print this out now, we can see that we've got like an array-like structure that has a token and the kind is a sign and the literal is equals. Um, so this equals to owned bit is probably a bit confusing as well. In PHP and JavaScript, you have a string. In Rust, you have a string and a string slice. So this is a string slice. 
it's not an instance of string. Um, it's not of this type. Uh, if you wanted to type hint this, you'd use uh, this instead of this. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but that's why I'm calling to owned. Rust is going to say, well, this is a string slice. It's going to look at the definition for this function and see that it needs to be a string. And it's going to say, I know how to do that. I'll turn this string slice into a string uh, instance instead, or of type string with a capital S. Cool, this is great. So this is basically the Lexa. We're going to go through and we're going to match against certain tokens. Um, and depending on what type of uh, character we're matching against, we're going to change the logic inside of here. So let's start doing keywords. Um, I think we can get this done pretty quickly, to be fair. Um, any questions? Any comments? I might be going too fast. I don't actually know. Um, yeah, just, just let me know. Um, cool. Uh, can Rust be integrated with PHP since the nature of is interpreted or compiled is different? That's a good question. Uh, PHP does have something called FFI, which is a foreign function interface, I believe. Uh, and that basically means that you can use any C functions, you know, standard C. Um, you can use any C libraries with PHP, as long as they've got like a particular header file and some declarations. Um, and you can actually build PHP extensions with Rust as well, uh, because Rust has uh, interop with C. You can pull in external C modules into Rust and you can compile Rust into like a, a C header file equivalent. Um, so yeah, you can kind of use Rust with PHP. That might be interesting to explore on a stream. Uh, so yeah, that is possible. It's not something I've played around with. I know um, Larry Garfield, who's working on the auto capturing multi-line closures with Nuno. I know he's uh, done a bit of work with that and some blog posts, but yeah, it's definitely something that's possible. Uh, the performance probably isn't great, um, or not as good as Rust on its own, obviously. But yeah, you can definitely do it. Um, cool, so let's, let's start passing out keywords. Let's do keywords. Um, since run is very fast, it seems. Yeah, Rust is very fast, but I think the, with the, the foreign function stuff with PHP, I think there's a performance penalty for sure, because uh, you're invoking it from an interpreted language and you've got to pass out head of files and stuff like that. There's there's a, an extra layer of complexity on top. Uh, let's actually start with strings, because strings are kind of interesting. Um, so, I'm gonna support single quotes for strings for now. So we need to escape this single quote just because it's inside of single quotes, just like you do in any language. Um, and what we need to do with a string is we basically need to loop over it until we reach the end of the string. So we're gonna say, have we seen this? Well, if we have, we're gonna keep on looping until we hit another single quote. I'm not gonna deal with, you know, I'm not gonna support escapes and stuff like that for now. Um, I'll just do string literals. So we need to increase our counter by one. Uh, and this is gonna consume this. It's gonna put us past this onto the next letter. Um, and we can say while self.currentchar, so this is gonna get the current character, and we can say is uh, alpha, or is alphabetic, or is ASCII alphabetic, uh, we'll say alphabetic. So we're going to loop here, uh, Mr. Semicolon. So what we're going to say is we're going to say whilst uh, whilst it's alphabetic, meaning it's not um, or actually we, we probably want to say alpha new, uh, is alphanumeric um, or even while self.currentchar is not equal to one of those 
because we're going to pass everything in between those two uh, single quotes, right? Uh, so we're going to loop over the string until then. So until it hits here, uh, we also need to bring up um, we need to build up another vector. So let's just call this buffer. And this is going to be a vector of chars. And um, we're going to say vec new. Uh, we'll do it like we've done above with the generic syntax. Uh, and this needs to be mutable because we're going to be pushing to it. Uh, so while self.currentchar is not equal to this, we're going to say uh, buffer.push uh, self.currentchar. And we're going to increment the uh, counter as well. So yeah, this is going to skip past the first uh, quote. It's going to create a new vector that will allow us to push things together, or push characters into it. Um, and we'll say until we hit another single quote, we want to get the current char and push it to this buffer because it's part of the string. And we're going to say self.cancer plus equals one so that we skip over that character. Um, and self.current char then moves on. Um, and then we'll say self.counter plus equals one as well, which will get rid of the closing uh, the, the closing quote mark there. And we'll create a uh, let string token equal token new token kind string. And the literal will be the buffer uh, joined by an empty string, I believe. Uh, sorry, that's not an empty string. That's an empty string. Or can we just say join on its own? And this is going to have a go at us because the following trait bounds were not satisfied. Method cannot be called on vecchar due to unsatisfied trait bounds. Uh, okay. Is that because we're using chars, maybe? Char as... Um, okay, let's, let's think about this. Do we want to do a vector of string slices, maybe? Let's have a think. Um, Um, let's think. So, why isn't this working? It's a vector of chars, right? So, um, Oh, actually, a better way of doing this instead of yeah, in, instead of doing a vector of chars, we could actually make this a string, and we'll set it to string new, so just an empty string, and then down here we can actually say uh, buffer dot push like this, and push is now expecting a char. We're we're pushing a single character to the end. Uh, so we don't need this buffer here because it's expecting a string. Uh, and in fact, we won't have the temporary variable either. We'll say tokens.push like this. Uh, and we've already skipped over uh, that there. We'll do that there instead. So we're pushing the token and we're setting the counter to one more. So if we run this now, uh, this seems to have worked because we've got our assign and we're passing out strings very naively, mind, uh, because we're, we're only accepting you know anything between two single quotes. There's no escape codes or anything. We can do that later. Um, but that seems to be working. Um, 
All right, let's pass out some of these. So how do we do this? <clears throat> We're going to want some sort of wild card again, I think. Um, so in pattern matching, we can say wild card and then have an if statement. So we can say only run this wild card block if um, C is alphabetic. Uh, so if we just print line uh, test here, if I run this, it's going to output test because L, E, T, they're all uh, alphabetic. Um, we can we can kind of see this in action if I do this. You can see it prints out test for L, E, T, um, F, O, O for let foo. Um, so this is good. So we're going to fall into here. And we're going to say... Um, we'll, we'll build up a string. Right, so we'll say just like we did before. Uh, let buffer equal string new, uh, and we'll, we'll put a type here. Why not? Doesn't need it, but we'll do it. Uh, we'll give the compiler some help. So we'll say let buffer equal a new string. Um, we'll make it mutable, and we'll push. We'll push C to it so that we can skip over it. Um, this isn't cursor, is it? This is counter. Uh, so we'll, we'll skip over that first character because we've already pushed it. We'll say while self dot current char dot is alphabetic like this. Um, we'll push self dot current jar we'll increment the counter by one and let's just print line uh, the buffer like this and this should be good so there we go uh, because we're not we're not accepting the spaces so when it gets here it's not alpha alphabetic anymore so it stops building the string and it just returns us the the word that we've built up so far eventually you know we'll have something like you can use underscores or dollar sign or something like that in a variable name but for now we'll keep it very simple uh, so now that we've got the word we need to see if the word is reserved so uh, down here we'll say match um, We'll, we'll say let kind equal match uh, buffer like this. So we can use uh, we can use match as an expression as well. So whatever we return from this match will be assigned to the kind variable. Uh, and we'll say kind needs to be a token kind. And again, we've got uh, certain patterns that we must match uh, as a as a string. So let's do, um, I don't want to do two owned everywhere because it, it gets messy. So we'll say as ref uh, and this will return um, bytes basically. No, I mean, that's, that's what it returns. It just, it returns bytes. Um, so I'm guessing actually what we need to say do we need to collect no we don't need to collect uh, let's say as str because now we'll be able to use these sort of ones here um, so if it if the buffer equals let we'll return token kind let um, if it doesn't match any reserve keywords we can kind of assume that it's an identifier so we'll return identifier instead uh, and if I print line here, again, it's a, it's an enum, so we need to use the debug formatting. We'll print out kind. 
if we run this, we've got the let and the identifier because remember we're returning those here. It's implicit. Uh, if the expression here is a single statement or a single expression, it will just use this as a return value. Uh, so now we need to do tokens dot push uh, token new kind and then the literal will just be the buffer perfect so you can see we've got our let token we've got our foo token we've got our assign token and we've also got our string token um, it's getting on it's 20 past 11 um, before I finish them, let's um, let's add support for double quotes as well, because why not? Let's change this to double quotes. Uh, so if we head back up here, we're saying if it is a single quote, and we can match multiple patterns, a bit like in PHP, uh, we want to say or if it's a double quote. Um, we'll get the let mark char equals self dot current char. Um, we'll say uh, while char is not equal to that and char is or. Hmm. Um, actually, no. A, be a better way of doing this, we can we can leave this as is. If I just undo this, uh, because we've got this C variable up here, which we can access because it's still in scope. Um, oh well, we've still got seven or eight people here. Nice. Um, because we've got this C variable up here, and it's in the scope of this block, we don't need to have like a if if self dot current char is not equal to single quote and it's not equal to double quote because if we start with a single quote we don't want it to end in a double quote so because we've got the char we can say if self dot current char is not equal to c which remember is pointing up here um, we'll continue to read it so this should just add support for double quotes and it seems to work um, great Okay, that was easy enough. Um, one more thing then. Let's add support for uh, escaping quotes like this. Um, so effectively what this needs to do is if we encounter a backslash and the next character in the string is the same as the opening character, we just need to ignore the backslash and push the, the character after. Um, so we can say if or if um, if this is really not optimized at the minute, it's very naive, but if self.current char equals a backslash, uh, we need to double escape that. Uh, so if it equals a backslash, we'll put this into the else block because that's what we want to do by default. Uh, if it equals a backslash, we'll skip over it by incrementing the counter by one. I think that makes sense. Um, and we'll push, push the next character because it's escaped. That works, but it doesn't work. Um, yeah, so how do we want this to work? We, we can actually get rid of that else block for now because we'll doing this we'll, we'll skip over the backslash and it will end up on, on the double quote anyway and because we're already inside of the block it'll push that skip over it and carry on I think let's make sure we've not broken anything bar 
Um, hmm. Why is self.counter not? Let's just print out self.current char inside of there. So we do get inside of it. Um, oh, I think I think it's because it's a string. When Rust is outputting it, it put, outputs it like that. Um, I think we, we we can test that just by doing this and printing out buffer. Yeah. Okay. So it does just push the the double quote on its own. It's only in the debug view that it escapes it still in the output. Okay. And now this this will kind of work. Like I said, it will work for double quotes or single quotes. If we go back to single quotes, uh, it'll do this. Um, you see, it's, it's got the, the single quote there. Um, Yeah, it's got it's got the single quote there, but in the case of this, where we're doing backslash double quote, this doesn't need to be escaped. Uh, so we need to add the check for that as well. We'll say if uh, we can say match self dot current char again. We'll do a, a bit of a nested match here. It's not not the prettiest, but it does work. Uh, so we'll match self.current char if um, we don't want to do this here we want to move this out we want to say if it matches C meaning it needs to be escaped uh, we'll do this so we'll increment counter by one so we'll skip over this. Um, otherwise, it won't do anything. We'll say underscore and just do an empty expression like this. Perfect. I think this is working. Uh, so let's just go down here and we'll say print line uh, buffer. So if I print this out, the it's still being skipped. Um, so if it equals that, we don't need to escape it. Um, oh, hang on. No. Let's, let's do it like this instead. Let's print line. Again, this is sort of nested spaghetti now, but we'll print that line. Okay, so it is doing that. Uh, do you, because it's a backslash, is it behaving weirdly, maybe? Um, don't really know. Let's have a think. Um, string. Okay. A, a moment of silence to think there. I think we can say if. In here, we'll say match self. Um, let, let's just, let's just keep it really naive for now. We'll, we'll just increment counter by one. I, I think that's fine. We'll, we'll increment counter by one, and then that way um, it will it will just skip over it if we if we escape. That's fine for now. You know, this is very basic Lexa stuff. It's it's nothing complex. Um, so what have we what have we achieved? Um, we've passed things out. If I just go in here and say bar, um, uh, where's cargo? There it is. 
uh, we're getting that, that token string. Let me just remove that print line quickly. Um, we're getting that token string, which is great. If we go back, uh, we're successfully tokenizing identify or keywords, um, identifiers, single tokens or sigils, um, and strings. Before we finish up, let's pass out numbers as well. Uh, so my, my plan is to treat it a bit like JavaScript, where one, two, three, four, five uh, isn't necessarily an integer, it's a number. Um, and one, two, three, four, dot five is also a number. So all numbers are represented as 64-bit uh, floating point numbers, or an F64. Uh, so let's do number as a new token kind. Uh, literal can stay as a string because we're not going to pass it out yet. That doesn't really matter. Uh, we're just tokenizing. We can add another bit here and we can say if C is numeric, like this. Uh, let, let's add an example in here. We'll say one, two, three, four, five. So this is numeric. We can basically copy this entire block here. Um, but we can say is numeric. Um, we want, we don't need this. And this is going to be token kind number. And this should technically work. Uh, option unwrap on a num value line 114, which is down here. Um, okay. Um, so if it's numeric, we push the character. Let's just print line high. So we get to high. Just move this about to figure out where it's going wrong. Um, we'll just print out C uh, like this. So it gets to one. Mm. But it's not getting past here. It's not incrementing it. So while self current char is numeric, so whilst it's numeric, we push the current char, we set the counter, and we go back to the top. Do we get down here with a buffer? No, we don't get there. Um, let's put it there, a bit of debugging. Okay. Um, oh, this, okay, this, this is because it, it's getting to the end here and it's trying to get the current char. Um, so this, this is kind of where the, the option safety comes into play because we have some and none. Um, so let's say self self dot current char dot is or while um, okay let's let's refactor this a little bit let's do option char let's not unwrap it let's return a char reference this is fine um, we'll say so while the source dot length is greater than self dot counter so that shouldn't ever happen should it
Um, any ideas? Any ideas? Any ideas? Let's think. Because basically we want to say, you know, whilst there are some characters in place around this loop, um, why don't we change this into a loop, which is like a, an infinite loop, just a, a while true. Uh, we can say, let's see equals self at current char. If C dot is none, we can break, break out of the loop, uh, and we'll say let's see equals c dot unwrap. Um, and we we kind of know that there's nothing here. Um, so we should probably up here say let current equals self uh, dot current char and here we can say while current uh, dot or while current is sum and current dot unwrap equals that uh, if current dot unwrap um, is not implemented for a reference. Uh, reverse out of all this. Let's go back to where we were with the loop before. I'm sure I'm just being silly. Um, so whilst it is numeric, increment counter Pushes up. Um, yeah, I guess we kind of need a check here to say if if self dot counter is less than self dot source dot length. Very naive. Uh, we can say self dot counter plus equals one, and I'll take this down here as well. Does this fix it? It does not. Um, plus equals one. Let's go back to here. Uh, let's go back to there as well. So we just want to we want to pass out a number. Um, hmm. Okay. So the last thing I'm going to do, and then I'm 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 going to end the stream. Uh, because we've, we've made good progress. I just want to figure this out. Uh, I don't like leaving a bug or uh, an issue untackled. So do we need to kind of change how we're looping? Maybe. Because what I'm thinking is, up here we're just saying, while, while the length is greater than the counter, um, obviously the length is going to be one more than the index. So we'll, we'll, at some point when we reach the last character, we will be going higher than the index, but because we're still in this loop, um, where is it? Be because we're still in this loop, it's gonna go back up and it's trying to unwrap current char. So actually let's, let's change this to a loop. Um, and we can say if, self dot counter uh, don't need the parentheses if self dot counter is greater than or equal to self dot source dot length um, 
we can break out of the loop. Um, again, very naive, we can refactor this later. Otherwise, we'll push the current char and we'll increment the counter by one. Yeah, that seems to work, cool. Uh, so we've got let foo equal one, two, three, four, five. Very quickly, we will um, check that it works with floats, which it should because it's just a string. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Perfect. Uh, and something that I actually want to implement now is number separators. Uh, so we can check. So this is 100,000. So this underscore is a, a number separator. Um, so this should pass it still because we've, we've removed that is numeric check. Um, so we can say if self.counter is great. Okay. And we can also say if self.current char, uh, if it's not, uh, is numeric or self.current char, uh, if it, if it's not numeric, we can break, uh, although that won't work for underscores and periods. So we need to put this up here. We need to say if self.current char equals uh, a dot or if self.current char equals an underscore. Um, if it equals an underscore, we can just skip over the, the underscore. Uh, which will work in this case, and we end up we end up with a hundred thousand, which is fine. Um, if if it's not numeric and it's not equal to a period, that should work too. So let's just do dot zero zero. Perfect. Cool. So we're passing. Uh, sorry, we're tokenizing or lexing numbers with number separators, as well as floats, uh, you know, with a period and then some decimal places afterwards. Cool. Uh, so I'm I'm gonna put this on GitHub uh, and I'll, I'll put the link on Twitter. I'll put it in the description as well to the repository so that we can uh, come back to this in the next stream uh, and carry on. The next step will be sort of, uh, making this a bit more efficient. You know, we're calling self.currentchar everywhere, uh, which is doing a, an index lookup and unwrapping it and dereferencing it. Uh, so we'll, we'll do some optimization and we'll implement some new tokens, uh, like a function keyword, um, some parentheses and stuff like that. Uh, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next step of passing this into an abstract syntax tree. Uh, so to the seven or five people that are still here, thank you very much for tuning in um, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.